In this Baldur's Gate 3 guide, we're going to be going through the races of Baldur's Gate 3 and going through their racial features, kind of discussing what they are, what classes they would be good for, and whether they are the right choice for you just based on their class features. You're obviously free to pick whatever you want from a role-playing perspective, and you may have your choices because of that. But in this video, we're just going to cover the things that make up the racial features of these races and whether they would be good for your class or not. So first up, let's take a look at the elf race. They have standard movement speed at 9 meters. They also have weapon proficiencies in short and long swords, as well as short and long bows. They can see a decent distance in the dark with their dark vision, and they have saving throws against being charmed, and they can't be put to sleep. The advantage on saving throws to charm and the immunity to sleep is nice, but dark vision doesn't quite have the distance to make you like a full range character here. You'd want 24 meters for that. So you're going to be playing like a mid range to close range character if you're leaning into that dark vision in dark places. And the proficiencies that you gain really benefit classes that don't have martial weapon proficiencies. So this is like some bards, some clerics, druids, monks, rogues, sorcerers, wizards, and maybe even warlocks. But if you took like a fighter or paladin, for instance, you would already have these weapon proficiencies, so they'd be kind of wasted. And the difference between High Elf and Wood Elf is that the High Elf can choose one cantrip at the beginning of the game. If you're talking about an offensive cantrip like Firebolt or something like that, Shocking Grasp, these are going to scale with Intelligence, so I don't recommend picking up an offensive one if you're not playing an Intelligence-based character. But there are some other utility ones there. For instance, Friends is a really strong cantrip if you're playing like a dialogue-focused character. A lot of dialogue-focused characters will be able to pick this up but it could save you a slot for a cantrip that you might be able to pick something else up with, or maybe if you're playing Paladin that doesn't get this, and you want to have this on your Paladin, it's not a bad choice. And what else gain movement speed? So that's really good for like positioning in combat and getting into melee range, particularly on a melee character, but also on a ranged character. Uh, so the, really the decision is, if you're playing an intelligence-based character, you might pick up an offensive cantrip. If you're playing something else, you might pick up one of the others, but movement speed on the what else is going to be good no matter what. Moving along to Tieflings, they have Dark Vision the same as Elves at 12 meters, and they also have something called Hellish Resistance, which gives them resistance to fire damage, meaning they only take half fire damage when they take fire damage. And the difference in subclasses really comes down to a couple things. First is the Cantrip or Level 0 spell they can learn at the first level. They each have a different one that kind of specializes in different things. We'll mouse over those so you can see what they are. But one thing that you won't see during character creation is that as these races level up, they'll actually gain spells as well, and they'll gain different spells. So the Asmodeus Tiefling will gain Hellish Rebuke and Darkness once per long rest at level 3 and level 5. And the Mephistopheles Tiefling will gain Burning Hands at level 3 and Flame Blade at level 5. Again, these are once per rest. And the Zariel Tiefling will gain the Searing Smite and Branding Smite abilities that they can use once each on long rest at levels 3 and level 5. Dark Vision, just like on Elves, is very useful for specific places of this game, making this a good racial choice for anyone. And I think the choice of subrace really comes down to the spells that you gain, uh, the ones that I mentioned as you level up, and also whether or not you want to use Thaumaturgy, which gives you advantage on Intimidation and Performance checks. So maybe if you plan to be a character that uses Intimidation a lot. Moving to Drow, Drows have Drow Weapon Training, which gives them proficiency with Rapier, Short Sword, and Hand Crossbow. They also have Superior Dark Vision, which allows them to see in the dark 24 meters compared to the 12 meters of Elf, Tiefling, and a couple other races. And they also have Fey Ancestry similar to Elves, which makes it so that they have advantage on saving throws against being charmed, and they can't be put to sleep. I'll say that the weapon proficiencies for this race are kind of negligible unless you're playing like a pure spellcaster that basically has no proficiencies, because Bard and Rogue have these proficiencies exactly, and even more. And so do other martial classes like Fighter, Paladin, Ranger. They have all these already, so... This isn't particularly great for most martial classes and most kind of hybrid classes. It's really only good for casters. I think because you have superior dark vision here, you are kind of be able to be a long range specialist in dark places. And I think if you plan to play a very long ranged character, Drow is a good choice because in those dark places, you'll still be able to connect with your ranged attacks with bows or crossbows or spells at long range. And you won't have the problems that maybe some other races will. And when it comes to the sub races, they really only have impact on dialogue options and the story. So from a stat perspective, they don't really factor in. But you should read these descriptions and see, you know, what fits best for you. And this brings us to humans. Humans have weapon proficiency with spears, pikes, halberds, and glaives, and also armor proficiency with light armor and shields. And they also have an additional skill to be proficient in, so they can pick one more on top of the class that they are. And their carrying weight has been increased by 25%. So the issue with the human proficiencies is that you would basically have to take a casting class to gain the benefit of this, or maybe a hybrid class 
that doesn't have access to martial weapons. So something like a cleric, maybe, uh, if it's not a Tempest or War Cleric, might benefit from this, being able to use these martial weapons as well, but they won't make use of the light armor proficiency since they'll already have this. So some of these proficiencies, kind of no matter which way you go, will be wasted. So that's not optimal. But the extra skill proficiency could be great on a utility character, like on a rogue or a ranger, or maybe a bard to gain even more skills, or maybe on a character that just doesn't have a lot of skills in general, since most other classes only have two skills. Picking up an extra skill could make them a lot more useful outside of combat. I think that's really the reason to pick human, is that extra skill proficiency. So this takes us to Githyanki, and Githyanki has something called Astral Knowledge, which makes it so they gain proficiency and all skills of a chosen ability until their long rest. So they can change this after each long rest, and by ability they mean something like dexterity or strength or intelligence, something like that. So if they pick dexterity, for instance, they'd have proficiency in acrobatics, sleight of hand, and stealth until their next long rest. And then maybe they, you know, take intelligence, and so now they have proficiency in arcana, history, investigation, nature, and religion. And they can keep changing this each time they rest, or they can keep it on the same one. But that's huge, right? This is, like, invaluable, because you can get an entire skill group of proficiencies just from this one thing, being able to change it constantly, kind of makes Githyanki ahead of a lot of races in terms of their effectiveness. And they also gain a decent number of proficiencies in light and medium armor, as well as proficiency in short swords, long swords, and great swords. So this is huge because, you know, maybe you have a hybrid type character, like a cleric or a druid, but you want to use a great sword, then you could use it right away just by taking this race. Or maybe you're playing a warlock or a wizard or sorcerer and you want some better armor. Like maybe you don't have any proficiencies because you're a sorcerer or wizard. Now you have medium armor proficiency. You could slap on medium armor instantly and have more armor class just from picking this one race. Making Get Yankee a really, really strong race between everything that they have. So this takes us to dwarves. The first thing you're going to notice is that they can only move 7.5 meters per turn compared to the norm, which is 9 meters. So they're not going to be able to move as much in combat. They have proficiencies with Battle Axe, Hand Axe, Light Hammer, and War Hammer. And they have Dark Vision, the same as Elves and Tieflings, at 12 meters, making it kind of mid to low range in terms of what they can see in the dark. And they have Dwarven Resilience, which gives them advantage on saving throws against poison, and they have resistance to poison damage. So just like Elf and Tiefling, Dark Vision is nice, particularly if you're playing like a mid to short range character, like a melee character or a very short distance caster. Um, the combat proficiencies in Battle Axes, Hand Axe, Light Hammers, and War Hammers are not going to be super useful. You're playing a martial class and still already have these these will be more applicable to maybe a class that's only got simple weapons or maybe even less than simple weapons so they're not particularly useful to a lot of classes that might take advantage of this and the dwarven resilience is just nice to prevent damage anytime you can prevent damage that's good so having that is a nice bonus the the downside again is the movement speed is reduced which means that you might have a harder time getting into melee combat or getting into position if you're a ranged character so for sub races, first is Gold Dwarf. This increases your hit point maximum by one and increases this again every time you gain a level. The level cap in this game is 12, so the most you'll be able to get out of this is 12 extra hit points. That's probably the equivalent of like one or one and a half levels depending on your class. That's pretty nice. Um, I think this is going to be far better later in the game than it's going to be earlier in the game, but it's a nice little bonus if you're trying to figure out what type of dwarf. This is just good on any character really. Shield Dwarves, on the other hand, gain armor proficiency with light and medium armors. And again, this kind of benefits non-martial classes and non, like, clerics are already going to have this, druids are already going to have this. So this is kind of like your rogues, warlocks, and maybe your wizard sorks. Uh, something like that is the classes that you would want this on. Otherwise, you're already going to have these proficiencies. So if you're not playing, like, one of those classes, maybe bard, you're really not going to take advantage of this much. Then you have Durgar, which gains superior dark vision, changes the regular dark vision into a, the 24 meter variant that the Drows also have. So this is great if you're planning to play a ranged character or a spellcaster that throws long range spells. That will help you a lot in dark areas connect with your spells. And they also gain advantage on saving throws against illusions and being charmed or paralyzed. So between that and poison, you'll be pretty tanky. And this is probably the best all around one to pick, in my opinion, because superior dark vision is very, very strong. So that takes us to Half-Elf. They also have weapon proficiency with spears, pikes, halberds, and glaives, and armor proficiency with light armor and shields, just like humans do. But they also have dark vision like elves, tiefling, and dwarves, so they're going to, again, have mid- to short-range dark vision in dark places. And just like elves, they have advantage on saving throws against being charmed, and magic can't put them to sleep. So really, the choice between Elf and Half-Elf, besides RP purposes, is the proficiencies. Do you want short and long swords and short and long bows, or do you want weapon proficiencies with stabby long weapons? And maybe the shield proficiency is what you're after. Maybe you're playing a warlock and you just want shield proficiency. This could be an easy way to get it. So that's really the difference between those. 
And I think that's what it's going to come down to is whether you need those proficiencies or not. And then sub races change a couple of things. High half elf works very similarly to high elf. You'll get to choose a cantrip. Again, the offensive ones are based on intelligence. So if you're not an intelligence character, you probably won't take those. So you'd be better picking up like a utility one like Blade Ward or Friends or something like that if you're not an intelligence character and you want to take high half elf. Wood half elf, on the other hand, will give you increased movement speed, allow you to move further in combat, just like wood elf will. And Drow half elf will give you access to the light cantrip, which will allow you to create light in dark places which, you know, might help offset some of the, you know, vision problems of some of your characters. You yourself will have some dark vision, so you shouldn't need it, but you might have party members that don't, and that's good in those cases. So this takes us to halflings, which the first thing you'll notice is that they have lower racial speed, just like dwarves at 7.5 meters, so they can't move around as well in combat as some other races. But they also have the lucky racial feature, which makes it so they effectively can't critically miss on attack rolls, ability checks, or saving throws. So that's like a 5% chance, 1 in 20 is a 5% chance roughly, to critically miss in any of these scenarios. And anytime that happens, they get to re-roll and use the new roll and die. So that's really, really strong throughout the course of a game. It might not seem like it initially, but you will probably trigger this, you know, a lot of times over the course of a very long playthrough. And they also have advantage on saving throws against being frightened. So they're not going to be able to be frightened very easily at all. And Lucky is just a great overall racial feature. It's probably one of the best in the game. So this is good for, like, this race is basically good for any class. But I probably wouldn't recommend it as much for a melee character that has to move around more than a ranged character. And then when you move to the sub-races, Lightfoot Halflings gain advantage on stealth checks, making them incredibly hard to spot when they're on stealth. And Strongheart Halflings have advantage on saving throws against poison and resistance to poison damage, kind of like dwarves do. So you're gaining some more resistance to damage or you're going to be a bit sneakier or a lot sneakier in this case. So depending on whether you're playing like a stealthy character or you're not playing a stealthy character, kind of determine which one of these two you choose. Because if it's not stealthy, then it's kind of the other one by default. So then this takes us to gnomes. They also have reduced movement speed, just like halflings and dwarves at 7.5 meters. And they have something called gnome cunning, which gives them advantage on intelligence, wisdom and charisma saving throws. That's three of the abilities. They basically get to roll two dice and take the higher value when doing a saving throw for any of those abilities. That's huge in my opinion, particularly if you pair this with a class that has saving throw proficiency in like these ones, or maybe they have saving throw proficiency in dexterity and, you know, strength, something like that. So that even though they don't have advantage in those, they're pretty well rounded in terms of their saving throws. And this is just good on really any class. First is Rock Gnome, which gives you Dark Vision at 12 meters and also gives you twice your proficiency bonus to history checks. So you're going to be really good at history checks in this game and you'll be able to see in the dark up to 12 meters, which is again medium to short range. That's really good all around in my opinion. And Forest Gnomes also gain Dark Vision at the same 12 meters, but they also gain the spell Speak with Animals. So if you don't have a character that can speak to animals in the game, but you really want one, this would be a great way to take that if you're not planning on adding any class or subclass from all the other classes that have this ability. This would be a great thing to pick up so that you can ensure you can speak with animals. This takes us to Deep Gnome. They're going to have superior dark vision up to 24 meters like Drow and Draugr have, which is really good for ranged characters. And they also have advantage on stealth checks. So they're very, very hard to see when they're stealth. So if you're going to play like a ranged assassin or an assassin type class, this would be really, really good for you because you're not only going to be able to apply, you know, your attacks very, very well in dark places, but you're also going to be very hard to be seen while you're in those dark places. So this is really, really good if you're planning on playing like a sneaky rogue or some sort of like ranged character that just snipes people from the shadows. So next comes Dragonborn. And Dragonborns get to choose from a lot of different sub-races. And effectively what these sub-races are going to do is they're going to give them a breath spell. And this breath spell does damage and targets a specific ability. Take note of what abilities these target because maybe you are playing a class that you know, doesn't have something that targets con, for instance, maybe you want to pick up a breast spell that does, so you have options to target the lower values of characters. But it also gives them resistances to a specific type of damage, and later on as they level up, it will also increase their damage of that type. So, for instance, if you pick White Dragonborn, you'll have Frost Breath, which targets Constitution, and you'll have Draconic Ancestry that gives you resistance to cold damage, and as you level up, you'll also have a way of increasing your cold damage as well. This brings us to our last race, the Half Orc. They also have 12 meter dark vision, so they can use dark vision pretty well, medium to short range. They also have something called Relentless Endurance, which makes it so that if they would be down from damage, they regain one hit point instead of being down. Um, I'm assuming that this is like a once per combat thing. Otherwise, this could just every time you take damage, you'd never go down, something like that. But still, that's really, really strong. 
because being down can be a pain in the butt and it can really change the flow of battle. And they also have savage attacks, which makes it so when they land a critical hit with a melee weapon attack, their damage dice are tripled instead of doubled, so they're going to have kind of a higher crit damage multiplier, if you will, than other races will. Or So if they crit, instead of getting double the damage, they might get triple the damage, which is really, really good if you're making like a crit focus build, and it's just good to have in general when you do critical hits. And this is just a strong all-around race because everyone benefits from Dark Vision. Relentless Endurance will keep anyone alive regardless of class. And Savage Attacks increased critical damage is good for just about anyone. So between Githyanki and Half-Orc, I think these are probably the two strongest races in the game because they benefit just about anyone and they have very, very strong features. So that wraps up our races guide. I hope you found this interesting and helpful and helped narrow down the race for you, at least in terms of the mechanics of the game from a mechanics perspective. Obviously, if you're RPing, this is not useful. You're going to pick whatever you want. That's fine. But just in terms of optimization, some races work better with some classes than others. And I hope you kind of learned some things about that in this video. If you have further questions, please leave them in the comments below.